My name is Laura Lewis, and I'm from Waxahachie, Texas. I have a statement here that I wanted to read on behalf of my mother and sister. On December 17, 2009, my mother and younger sister were falsely incarcerated by County Judge Gene Calvert, Jr. He sentenced them to 180 days without bond on a false contempt charge. Throughout their false imprisonment, my mother was denied her blood pressure medicine. She suffers from depression, anxiety, loneliness, and is even diagnosed with post-traumatic post disorder. Even though these, these symptoms are vulnerable for anyone to be partly insane, the biggest tragedy for my mother was accepting the fact that her youngest daughter was also an inmate. My sister often suffers from nightmares. She has nightmares of dying. She feels that one day she will fall asleep and never wake up. While incarcerated, her high levels of stress and struggle produced an increased, fa uh, excuse me, increased fa uh, excuse me, facial acne. To look at them now on the outside, it may seem, it may seem as though my mother has it, and my sister has it all together. Their inside is full of hurt and pain. That goes beyond the pers any person's ex appearance. You would think that a woman inflicted to lose her job, house, car, everything, and even a young a young lady having to excuse me, and even a young lady having to sacrifice a semester at Texas Tech, that it would arouse a federal judge's curiosity. Yet federal judges in Texas are impressed with county and federal and federal colleagues of theirs. Instead, they don't see reason to continue the trend to, to excuse me, they, instead they don't see reason to not to continue the trend of scandal and corruption. You watch my back, I watch yours. I had the great opportunity to interview, talk to, and even experience secondhand what my mom and my sister went through. Even though I wasn't there, I definitely went through the, the tragedy of this experience. With me being a broadcast journalism major, I also had the opportunity to write about my mom and my sister's experiences. Their article was published in the Dallas Post Tribune early this year, 2012. It was my complete honor. I was privileged to be amongst legendary, soon to be le legendary, because I know that the system doesn't work for mothers, doesn't work for human beings. It doesn't work for parents. It doesn't work for those who care for their children. It matters to those who can really get away with it. And like I said, I, had, I was so privileged to be in the presence of these ladies who have endured and have conquered a lot of stress. And not so much, and not so much to the point to where they can take it, but to the point to where they can do anything about it. The story is called Traditional Victims. For years, standard law has been idolized as the foundation of this land. Its experience is a detailed image of our forefathers and main purpose to uphold equality for, for all throughout greater adversity, right? Wrong. According to Linda and Alicia Lewis of Waxahachie, Texas, the law is set forth only to be twisted, bended, and altered by judges. On December 17, 2009, L. Lewis, my mother, and Alicia Lewis, my younger sister, attended, Watch excuse me, attended Waxahachie County Court in support of a relative. Waxahachie County Judge Gene Calvert, Jr. had asked those individual, the individuals to come forth in regarding the relative. When L. Lewis stood up, Judge Calvert, excuse me, Judge Calvert verbally immediately struck at her. 
As L. Lewis was leaving the courtroom, she said, oh my God, Judge Calvert immediately had her arrested. When A. Lewis went to grab her mother's hand, she was arrested, further being struck to the ground by a bailiff. Both ladies were sentenced to 180 days on a contempt charge without any bond. The establishment of the illegal actions and the Lewis's false imprisonment occurred as follows. Issue one, fraud upon the court by sentencing both ladies to 180 days on a malicious contempt charge. Thus, County Judge, excuse me, thus County Judge Calvert maliciously upheld that prior, the prior hearings December 17, 2009, waived all their rights to a court reporter. Result in effect, the Lewis family requested that the transcript pertaining to the, con the contempt charge had asked for it. Instead, the family was fined for a false transcript that was substituted regarding the non-existing transcript. Mm -hmm. They were charged for, for a transcript, excuse me, for a transcript that didn't exist. But yet, Judge Calvert says that 30 people before the Lewises waive their rights to an attorney, then there should be no transcript at all. There should be no substitution. Issue two, Judge Calvert dismissed an appeal which was out of his jurisdiction. The appeal was set forth to remove the, Lew to remove the Lewis's case. Result and effect. At the appeal hearing, both ladies were sworn in under oath, but were rejected to testify on their own behalf, on their own behalf. Issue three, in regard to the writ of Haper's corpus, the motion to reverse Judge Calvert's decision, the Lewis's, the Lewis's court-appointed attorney, Billy Summers, requested charges on account, of, on account of both ladies. A. Lewis had no record of misconduct at all. Result slash effect. A. Lewis was documented to be in contempt based on a scanned over contempt charge, meaning that they had took Linda Lewis's contempt charge, replaced it with Alicia's name, but they left out at the bottom of the transcript, they left out replacing Alicia Lewis's name with Linda Lewis's name. Issue four, Judge Calvert then heard the writ of Haper's corpus that was indeed against the decision of contempt, further assuring, further assuring his, script, his scripted comments were documented to express the lady's contempt charge. According to the Code of Conduct, judges may not hear cases in which they have either personal knowledge of the disputed facts, a personal bias concerning a party to the case, Early, earlier involvement in the case as a lawyer or a financial interest in any party or subject matter of the case. Issue five, both ladies carried out a 180 day sentence without any charges. The Lewises have been in contact with the State Commission, in, excuse me, the State Commission on Traditional Conduct for Assistance. Unfortunately, they have turned their backs on the Lewises, allowing that the allowing that Judge Calvert perform malicious, prose malicious, malicious prosecution, fraud, violating their civil rights, due process, denying particular evidence, be re excuse me, denying particular evidence, be released, and phone hang-ups by representatives. On April 10, 2012, L. Lewis spoke before the Sunset Advisory Committee composed of senators and House members, where they also agreed the secrecy between judges and the State Commission, and the State Commission on Traditional Conduct lack productivity when it comes to the people. The committee questioned the State Commission's strict policy when releasing information to the Sunset staff. The staff, excuse me, the State Commission referred it as the Constitution. If the Sunset Committee had access to review me and my daughter's case, they would see that the State Commission on Traditional Conduct have allowed Judge Calvert to break the law, L. Lewis says. 
The fight still goes on for the Lewises, who, strong, who strongly believe that they, will preve that they will prevail. Due to the State Commission on Traditional Conduct allowing Judge Calvert to break the law, L. Lewis, L. Lewis's case is under appeal while A. Lewis is also under appeal with the exception of excuse me, defamation of character in harsh and inhumane cell conditions. Our pro se status is one of many reasons why justice has not been served, says A. Lewis. As of late, it seems as though the law is nothing but a distraction for those who solemnly swear to abide by it. Is our is our country to the point to where the rules, regulations, and even the law were created and intended to be broken? The Lewises have no problem replying to that question with a simple yes. Like I said before, um, I was so honored to do this lady's story. Not only were they a part of me, you know, they have been, they were, they have been a part of something that has happened and they are going to be a part of history. Something that I am so glad to be a part of. My whole thing in this whole this whole situation, while my mother was and sister was falsely incarcerated, I was attending Hampton University in Hampton, Virginia. I had gotten a full scholarship to play basketball. I carried out my full scholarship, I performed, and I did well. I am also a two-time champion, MEAC champion, and, and I am, I'm so proud of that. However, I got the opportunity to, to be a part of a tragedy at the same time. My mother and sister were incarcerated at two, in, excuse me, December 17, 2009, I was currently in my basketball season. When I was looking for them, it was really crazy because I would call my mom and she wouldn't pick up and I would call my grandmother and she wouldn't pick up and when my mom finally got to me, I said, where are you? Why aren't you picking up the phone? What's going on? Like I'm the mom. She says, oh, I'm fine. I'm doing good. I'm, you know, everything is okay. I'm like, oh, all right. Okay, so you're not answering my question. Where have you been? She goes, um, and then the phone hangs up. I look at it, and I'm like, we have Verizon. There's nothing should be going on. So she'll call me back. And then I heard the operator say, you have two minutes left. And I was, I was shocked. I know what that signifies. I know the ending to the conversation. You don't hang up by yourself. It gets hung up, the phone gets hung up for you. She calls me back, I said, Mom, are you in jail? She says, yes. I don't get an explanation because she is now now she's not a, allowed to go for go go further with her conversation. I get a call from my aunt, my aunt Laura, who is her my mother's identical twin. I go to my coach and I cry out. I say, "Well, what's going on? What am I to do? You know, I have no one right now." So my Aunt Laura calls me while I'm in the office with my basketball coach and she encourages me and she's like, Laura, it's going to be okay. I am named after her. Laura's going to be okay. I said, hey, Laura, I feel useless. I feel useless. I am no good here. I might as well be as alive as this basketball that I'm holding. I am useless here. So. As she goes on, she goes on to tell me that everything's going to be okay. As months and months continue to pass, my mother and my sister are still incarcerated. I'm going crazy. I'm losing my mind. I have literally dropped down to hell. I found it very hard to 
fulfill my basketball scholarship, excuse me, my scholarship. And even though it was a joy that I love, I found it very difficult to, to carry out. I finally got a phone call saying that my mom, my sister, was still in jail, and that it looks like they will be carrying out their sentence after no charges were dropped. I go into my championship. I fall crazy in one of, the, in one of my uh, hotels. And I'm so glad that there's no one to see me because I have my own room and I, I'm twisting in the bed and I don't know what's going on. I don't have that, I don't have that, uh, that comforting of a mom. No matter how old we get, we, we always want that. And they're always willing to give us that, especially the good ones. So I lost that. Like I said, I went crazy. I went crazy. And even though I'm, I'm 21, you know, I'm still going through life. I've, I'm still being taught life. My mom and my sister get out. And it's not easy. I'm still not there. So as I go on to fulfill my education, my, my grades start, my grades do drop. I'm not doing my homework. I'm not eating. My nails are down to little of nothing. And I get called to an advisor, an athletic advisor. She is one of my closest friends. And she says, Laura, do you think that your mom would really like if you, if she saw you right now? Rib cage, because I haven't been eating. My rib cage, like you can see, my entire rib cage. She tells me to lift up my stomach, I mean, excuse me, to lift up my shirt. I dread doing it. So she says, Laura, if you don't get yourself together and come to us for help, I will write your mother in jail knowing that I'm on the urge to being the first person to be, to graduate from, the first person in our family to graduate. I click, I wake up, and I say, please, don't. It will hurt her more to know that even though she is behind bars, she's doing her thing, but I'm free and I'm not doing my thing. So she declined and she's like, okay, we'll get it together. Well, I told her I was eating cranberry juice and she still didn't get them. <laughs> she still was whatever. So it was still, it was still to the point to where I needed to get help. And I was like, no, I don't want help. I can do this on my own. I'll just come to you when I do need it. So my mother and sister finally get out. I am not there. I have to finish summer school so I can, um, so I continue, so I can get out of school um, early. I always recommended that, you know, summer school is always a plus. So I'm not there. They're out, they're good, and I'm, I'm happy, I'm happy. But what people don't see, what you don't see, is that I get to experience the first, I get to, I get to experience the life after. The life after comes pain and hurt and suffering, and even then, it goes on, you remember. You get to experience that I had to endure life without my, my, my mom. I had to endure life without my child. I have, to endure, I have to survive because the system, this world, doesn't give me the resources to live, to love. 
I had to go without my sister for a while, my best friend. She, her and I lost all relationships. And we are still, to this day, trying to get that back. So that was my involvement in all of this. And even though I am not a true victim, I still am a victim because I get to experience things that you don't get to experience. I get to look at my mom's face when another emotion's been denied. Or when my sister tosses and turns and gets up and heats. I get to experience that. While you all lay in bed, driving the Lamborghini, I get to secondly, I get to experience my mom's pain. Back to cases. When my sister was convicted of a felony charge, mind you, she has no charges. My sister was, my sister was charged, excuse me, not convicted, she was charged with a felony. Her judge, Judge Jean Canaz of Waxahachie, Texas, his mother was currently staying at a senior citizen, senior citizen's home. Out of all the people in the world, my mom's sister, my aunt, Ruby Anthony, was her nurse. And she, my aunt goes to her, Mrs. Kanaz, and says, what's going on with your son? He has my niece and my sister down there. What's going on? She's like, oh, I don't know. He's never acted like this. This is so out of his character. So my aunt calls him up and she says, I need to see you. So she pick, he picks her up in, her, in his Lamborghini and she gets onto him hard because this is the lady that takes care of his mother. This is the lady out of all the people in the world. My aunt takes care of the mother of my sister's ju felony judge. And she says, what's going on? What are you doing? He said, I'm doing fine, Miss Ruby, I'm doing fine. Well, you have my niece, and you are her judge. And I'm going to tell you something. Those women are innocent. The next day, my sister had no felony charge. Had, he, had, had she, had my aunt not talked to Judge Kanaz, she would have been convicted. And she would be in prison to this day for some, with no charges for something she didn't do. The accusers are as follows. Judge Jean Calvert, Jr., Ellis County, Texas. District Attorney Joe F. Grubbs, Judge L, excuse me, now, who is now a judge, Ellis County, Texas. Sheriff Johnny Brown, Ellis County, Texas. Judge Bob Carroll, Ellis County, Texas. State Commission on Traditional Conduct, Austin, Texas. Chief Judge Sidney A. Fridswater, United States District Federal Court for the Northern District of Texas. And that's my sister's judge. Magistrate Judge Paul D. Stickney, United States District Federal Court of the Northern District of Texas, Alicia Lewis, which is also my sister. District Judge David C. Godby, United States District Federal Court of the Northern District of Texas. He is the judge on my mother's behalf. Ma uh, excuse me. Magistrate Judge uh, Amar C. Ramirez, United States District Federal Court for the Northern District of Texas, also for my mother. And Commission Judicial Conduct, New Orleans uh, of Louisiana. As of now, we, struggle, we are struggling to keep our family together. 
it amazes me every time I walk past a courtroom or I see a place where you're supposed to you're supposed to go get your driver's license or you're supposed to go uh, pay your ticket and know that that is really a system that we have been taught to do like we've just been taught to you know really go by what they teach us in school this has been passed down to us in our history classes or in our math class or even our chemistry classes. All this stuff is passed down to a, you know, a system where they think that we're supposed to just go along with it. I think the biggest fear for a lot of judges, traditional police officers, attorneys, anything, your biggest fear is that the people that still, lit, that the people that still wanna fight live today. And that is your biggest fear. Your biggest fear is that you won't lose your house because the next guy that you see tomorrow, you're just gonna find him guilty and you get your next paycheck. Or the mother that you deny rights to see her children, or the mother that you see that you deny equal rights to. It's no one to you. It's just a little spackle on your shoe and you dust off and you walk on. I have a, uh, a letter that my sister wrote that I would like to read to you. Would you go ahead and give it to me? Do you want to do this to Congress? Mm -hmm. The letter she wrote to Congress. You want me to read it? Or yeah, you can read it. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. To Congress. Okay. I want to first thank my mom and my sister for speaking on my behalf. I have gone through a lot with what we call our judicial system. In school, I was taught that no one is above the law and the law is here to protect you. That was until I really got a reality check from the magistrate judge Paul D. Stickney and Chief Judge Sidney A. Friswater, where they taught me that there are certain people above the law and they wear the black robes and carry wooden gavels. Texas has one of the worst traditional systems because they think that they are above the law and no one can stop them. The Texas traditional system has been getting away with so much injustice that it has become their nature to violate people's civil rights. But who will stop them? They continue to, they continue to do so much because we let them. We hide, we let, we let it go, we forget. I respect my mom so much because she does not hide, she will not let it go, and she will never for, forget, nor will I. I remember a time where people used to fight for what they believed in, protest in front of their offenders, and die for what they believed in. But now, they are running scared because we do not have, excuse me, because we are not, because we are not only, we do not only have to fight our offenders, but we have to fight the traditional, the traditional system as well. It pains me to see that the, that the traditional system has done, has done to so many. Knowing how bad the traditional system is, I asked both Judge, excuse me, both Judge Fritzwater and Judge Stickney to recruit themselves. So instead of recruiting themselves, they dismissed my case to remind me that they are the law. So in my case, the judges that were appointed to my, to my case contradict, contradict themselves, allowing my civil rights to be violated and treat me like dirt beneath their shoes and that they could just wipe it away. Well, here, well, here is a reality check for them. I am still there and I won't be wiped away. I have nightmares every night. I cry myself to sleep from all the pain. I am scared every time I walk, up, I walk outside because of people 
like Frizzwater and, and, and Stigney, that let injustice happen without consequences. The worst thing these two judges have given me is anger. They have put anger in my heart and pain in my soul that I have yet to overcome. But they don't care. I'm nothing to them. Well, that's where they're wrong. I am the reason they sit on the bench. They are there to protect people like me to ha who have been wrong, yet, yet they wrong us more. I pray that justice is served not only for my family, but for every family that has been wronged by the traditional system. I know that I know the pain they feel because I feel it every day. I do want to say never give up. They will pay the price for what they have done and what they continue to do. Thank you, Alicia Lewis. My sister could not attend today because she has difficulty in, in the public eye. So I am speaking on her behalf. And even though it, it pains me to, to, to tell the story, I wouldn't rather be, I wouldn't be nowhere else but right here speaking her history, speaking her legend. Because things that hurt the most always, whatever's done in the dark will come to the light. My mom also has, my mom and sister also have another case against the Waxahachie Daily Light. This is the local newspaper in Waxahachie. This certain corporation has been expired for the past 10 years, yet they continue to publish newspapers. They are in violation of, with the Secretary of State, as well as the state. How do you all do your taxes? How do you all function without being existent? They have posted ever since, excuse me, ever since February, excuse me, January of 2010 have posted my, my mom's and my sister's photos the front of every page of the Waxahachie Daily Light. They have been compared and posted with convicted murderers. They have, their mugshots have been front and within the article and within the pages of the newspapers. This is their headshots. And it continued to, and up until the, the last day they were released. And that trial still, and that, here, excuse me, that case still goes on. I know that me being here is not for me. I'm not here on behalf of myself. I'm here beyond a greater purpose. I'm here for my mother, and I'm here for my sister. I think the greatest gift that I could give to them was not only to finish my degree, which I did get a broadcast, which I did receive a broadcast journalism degree and a minor in psychology, and now I'm one of 30, of 36 grandchildren to graduate. And I, and I can stand up in here and say that my mother gave me that, that my sister gave me that. Because of the fight in them, I was able I was able to put my hands and, and step my first steps into life and put my first steps into life and succeed and conquer something that many don't get to conquer.
I am grateful. I'm honored to be amongst such distinguished women. Even though my mother and sister could have went insane, they are still alive and will die trying. Okay. My current, my, excuse me, my sister is going to Texas Tech. Right, as of right now, she isn't currently there. Um, but she is going to start taking online classes. Well, I went to Texas Tech. Yeah. Did you? Yeah, right. She is a true Raider. Is she? She's well, a she true. She's got to be really happy about the football team. She is so. yeah. true, a true Raider. Yeah. They play, um, who is that? Uh, some, who they play? Uh, yeah, it's not play TCU. TCU, yeah. but they have another game coming on. I forgot who they're playing, but it's nationwide. Big, game. Big, game. Yeah, big game. Big game. Big game. Another rival. Yeah. yeah.